could be here in case people had questions about the building or the history of the building or how the city operates. Um, <laughs> not how the city operates. The city doesn't operate. Um, Ginevra is also here who led like a tremendous amount of the research. Um, so if you guys have questions on any facet of it, like Abigail said, attack us now. Yep. I'm curious that the, ma the mastodon skeleton is actually here in this building. Can you tell me more about that? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was in the room, the home room. The, well, that's what I call it. I think the opposite. But the one called the fence is. Um, so yeah, it was up Yes, the, uh, Charles Wilson Peel excavated the skeleton of uh, uh, the mammoth in uh, New York State in the early 1800s. And uh, he, he brought, oh, and, and he brought the, um, there were several skeletons actually, uh, two of them that we've tracked down. Um, and the skeleton of the master now was exhibited here in uh, 1814 when uh, Charles Wilson Peel's son, Rembrandt, opened the building. And uh, the, uh, there's one of these uh, massive skeletons, uh, uh, kind of plexiglass version, can be seen in the Maryland Historical Society. And there's two real ones that we know of. One is in Germany, and the other, I believe, is in um, uh, New York City at the uh, Natural History Museum. When, when they excavated the skeletons, they did not know about the, um, the theory of extinction. They did not understand that um, animals could go extinct or anything could go extinct. And when Jefferson sent uh, Lewis and Clark West uh, on their famous expedition, he asked them to look for the mastodon out there. <laughs> Peel Center. Yes. <laughs> 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 the Peel Center. It's confused with this one. So it's the Peel Center. The Peel Center.org. So check us out online. 
um, and and uh, expect a new a new dawn for the Gill building in the future.
not in a systematic way, uh, coverage of the Baltimore Sun and so on. It seems to me that the Baltimore artist community is commentary on the uh, often very glibly advocated destruction of these monuments, one of them by an eminent uh, woman sculptor, Lord Garden Fraser, who beat out all the competition, including Baltimore's own uh, sort of in-house monumental memorialist, Hans Schuller. Um, there's very little said about this. Um, I, I don't want to relate it to Nazi Germany, but I was thinking about something. I saw this woman with this amazing talk when I was at Radcliffe, and she's doing all this research about how actually all of these attitudes haven't gone anywhere. It's a couple generations past. The kids now don't care. They don't see how this affects them in any way, that this is what their great-grandparents or grandparents were a part of. They don't want to feel guilty anymore. They don't want to think about these things. They want to get past it. They want to move on. And so this, the same kinds of then anti-Semitic attitudes are coming to head. And so it's like they have all of these monuments in, in Berlin mostly. I think in other parts of the country, they're not into it. You know, I think she said in, in Munich, they won't allow the kinds of commemorative things that have happened in, Ber in Berlin to happen in other parts of Germany. So I think uh, just because there's something positive that's like state sanctioned doesn't mean that there's an actual attitude of like repentance or like understanding or healing. So I don't know if making something super positive means that you've gotten past like the trauma or reality of the, of the situation. And then I, I don't know if it's for people to get past it. Maybe these things need to be constantly remembered so that there isn't like an historic amnesia and the thing re reoccurs all over again.
most part of people who like lived in like straight up like burnt out buildings, uh, demanding that the city work with them in the 80s and 90s and rebuild a kind of affordable housing home in the place. But now it's like the final frontier for gentrification in New York, and it still has like the highest concentration of poverty. So like median income in South Bronx is like maybe twenty five thousand dollars or something. But, you know, rent in Brooklyn is like on average three thousand. So. Um, People started to trickle into that space, and it was it was this old courthouse, but all the uh, streets surrounding it were burned out, like eight vacant lots up until about 2007. So in the last 10 years, all of a sudden they've erected all these condo buildings around it, and so now this developer that's been holding out the building for 20 years decides to reopen it and open it to a kind of intermediary arts group so that they can curate a show. And I think the group is trying to be sensitive about including Bronx artists, but they were still kind of like being insensitive to the surrounding community. And there was this great group called Moms on the Move that came in and protested at the opening and like scared like these art world people to death. <laughs> <laughs> they had their kids with them, they were just screaming and yelling, and they had these flyers that were in English and Spanish, like you can't use art to pimp us out. Like, you know, we know what this is, right? And uh, I think it was just like a really traumatic thing. Like I it was again another opportunity that I could not say no to. And I was installing this funky basement that had all kinds of mold in it. And there was this one day that I was coming at 8 o'clock in the morning to come to install, and there's a kid on a building right out, right across from the courthouse who's um, on top of the building about to commit suicide. And there's like a group of people like watching, you know, on their way to work, school, calling the police over. And so like this is the kind of like Playing, like it's playing what this is, you know, and then here you are coming to install art, which is like weird, but you know, I think uh, that's what I want to get told to yeah. um, You mentioned that you went to the um, Blacks and Wax Museum mm -hmm. and you saw the slave ship part, and like the, um, so you heard the, the part with like the howling and the stuff that they have going on in there at the same time. Did they have any? Um, inspiration on like the parts of the room, of the building, like the classroom with like the sounds in there. Like, as I was trying to figure out, that was like footsteps or like scratch, like like um, chalk on the wall. Yeah, it's so, chalk. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's chalk. No, I think I think maybe it got even more than I realized, but it's definitely the one that I made a reference to was the black, the black hole in the trash cans. Oh, okay. Uh, so Justin, Justin Hicks is the reason why you hear there's all of these sound pieces in the house, but we found a songbook from 1850 and we gave it to him and he composed uh, like original compositions to some of the songs that were in his book. So part of the curriculum that these kids learned in the 19th century was they had a drawing textbook, a songbook that was issued, so they all sang together. So like the kinds of tools that people were like being given was very different from Oh, well, typical museums don't want to do anything. They don't know where everything was from. If it's rusty, was it treated properly? Meaning, was it like put in a, is it like a frozen chamber or something? Something where it has to be treated at high temperature to make sure that the rust isn't going to contaminate other objects in the space. So I think the thing about institutions, <laughs> I, I don't want to talk bad about institutions. I love them. They're wonderful, but I think something happens where they get like really big, you know, like too big to fail kind of thing. You know, like it's like a big, it's like a snail or like a tortoise, and it's not really moving. It's not really doing much. You know, it's just still kind of existing, but it's not actually like in tune with whatever's going on outside and around it. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, the Peel Center is letting me do this right now. Let's see what the Peel Center is doing. If they got 
people throw trash in all the rooms, like, after the road. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I want to uh, congratulate Abigail uh, on the sensational job that she did with this. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think that uh, she's obviously a quick study and uh, was able to capture uh, some of the uh, essence of the building and what it's represented in Baltimore over the last 200 years, and to turn that around artistically in a way that people can uh, grasp it uh, today. And that's sort of what uh, the Peel Center is going to do, uh, and to take the things that this building was known for uh, over the years, art, natural history, technological innovation, light, the artificial lighting of American cities began in this building with gas lighting, uh, and to uh, make these things uh, relevant to a 21st century audience, and I think Abigail has gotten us off to a really good start. Uh, with regard to the, uh, the Peel family, there was an enormous family. Uh, I think Charles Wilson had something like uh, uh, 10 or 11 children that uh, lived, several were artists. There was a, a uh, uh, there were, uh, some of the uh, daughters were artists. There was an Angelica Peel. They were portrait artists, mostly. Uh, Charles Wilson had a brother uh, who uh, also had a large family, several of whom were artists. <coughs> Excuse me. So one of the things we have to do in here when we get the building op open is to present uh, the Peel family, they were the first family of American artists, uh, to a um, a lot of the uh, public so that uh, uh, we can see who these people were and what they did. Uh, it was really an amazing family um, that created these museums. The one in Philadelphia that Charles Wilson began was the ancestor of the Smithsonian. He tried to make a national museum and wasn't able to.